I was born in the darkest of ignorance. My spiritual master opened my eyes with the torch of knowledge. I offer my respectful obeisance unto him. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Nama Om Vishnu Vidaya Krishna Vishnu Vidaya, Sri Mate Bhakti Vidanda Swamini Vamani, Namaste Saraswati, Deve Gauravani Vicharini, Nirvashi Shashunyavadi Vasjaja Eshatari, Hare Krishna. Jai, so thank you very much. In fact, we were on television the other day. Uh, I didn't really, wasn't so aware of it. Uh, it had to do with um, widening the sidewalk on Avenue Road uh, so that uh, people could have more comfort in walking. It's very tight in certain areas, especially by the temple. And also many people have got the idea that Avenue Road is a nice raceway. So if I'm gonna rev it up, I'm gonna uh, you know, uh, make my engine loud so everybody can notice that I'm important. And uh, it's a, especially from St. Clair going south, it's downhill and people go wee and they have a good time. But local residents don't like it. So I was on one of the local, one or two of the local channels and, yes, uh, and I was walking through uh, Govindas and one person, oh, well, you're a movie star, so why? Because you are on TV. Okay, great. So it does have to do with walking and safety. Safety is a big uh, topic these days. And uh, so that's, uh, we're still staying uh, in with the media, which is kind of fun for me. I hope you like our new background. I feel like a grasshopper uh, <laughs> in amidst the prairie grass. Uh, but uh, we thought the green was a nice uh, and light rejuvenating color. <clears throat> so let us begin then with chapter 15. Uh, and uh, two verses, eight and nine. And I guess it would be appropriate to read a little bit and then I'll discuss. This is called Yoga of the Supreme Person. And here is the shloka with the Sanskrit. Shariranyad avapnuti yas chap yukramatishwaraha grihit vaitani samyapi vayur gandhan ivashayat. And the translation. The living entity in the material world carries his different conceptions of life from one body to another. As the air carries aromas, thus he takes one kind of body and again quits it to take another. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. Here, the living entity is described as Ishvara, the controller of his own body. It's too bad we can't get this on the screen, uh, Ananda. I don't know if that's possible in the future, maybe. <clears throat> Here the living entity is described as he's really the controller of his own body. If he likes, he can change his body to a higher grade. And if he likes, he can move to a lower class. Minute independence is there. The change his body undergoes depends upon him. At the time of death, the consciousness he has created will carry him on to the next type of body. If he has made his consciousness like that of a cat or dog, he is sure to change to a cat's or dog's body. And if he has fixed his consciousness on godly qualities, he will change into the form of a demigod. And if he is in Krishna consciousness, he will be transferred to Krishna Loka in the spiritual world and will associate with Krishna. It is a false claim that after the annihilation of this body, everything is finished. The individual soul is transmigrating from one body to another. And his present body and present activities are the background of his next body. 
one gets a different body according to karma. And he has to quit this body in due course. It is stated here that the subtle body, which carries the conception of the next body, develops another body in the next life. This process of transmigrating from one body to another and struggling while in the body is called karshati, or struggle for existence. So we'll talk about this verse in purple right now. Okay, and then we'll move on to the other one. Namo so this is the time of the year that uh, the geese, called Canadian geese, they fly, they go south uh, during the winter time. So based on instinct, or what Prabhupada calls the super soul within, these massive and majestic birds that we can sometimes call honkers uh, move, start moving to the south. And they do it in such a glamorous way. They move in a V shape. And when I see them in the sky, I think of Vishnu, V for Vishnu, or V for Vaishnu. And they do it in such a charismatic way, and also in an incredible teamwork. Uh, the, the one bird that is heading the air, arrow, let's call it an arrow shape, uh, flight formation, uh, does it for some time. He cuts through the wind and because he's the first one. Then when he gets a little bit tired, exhausted, he moves over and another bird that's in the formation comes in and gets to the helm of it, of this formation. And this particular procedure continues to go on. So not only is it um, like exciting to see these birds in flight, and sometimes they come really close to your rooftop, so you can really hear them. Uh, it is also amazing that they have this teamwork going on, this uh, solidarity, and uh, it's something that we can learn from them. Now, the reason why I bring up this point is that they are migrating, that's what it's called. Uh, they're migrating from, from one region to another. In this case, they're crossing a border and they're going south. Some people like these birds, others do not. In George Harrison's last album called Brainwashed, there's a, in his lyrics he says, uh, and Canada geese are pooping all over the place. So some people don't like their piles because in the, the uh, let's say clear, they always land in a clear area on water or on land, and it's got this nice grass that they seem to really thrive on. So they're moving about. And um, little do they know, these uh, marvelous flying creatures, that when they do die, they will, uh, in fact, um, move on into another existence. So I'd say this verse and the next verse, they're very strong uh, like the supporters, endorsements towards the concept of transmigration of the soul. Usually when we make reference to transmigration or reincarnation is the other term, uh, we refer to uh, some shlokas from Bhagavad Gita chapter 2. De and in that shloka, that particular one uh, from chapter 2, Krishna is telling Arjuna that um, we, are, uh, we are the soul and we are embodied. That means we are encased by a body and we're going through our experience within one life. But one life as a child or baby, then a child, then a, in regular age. And then finally, uh, we reach uh, an aging period, maturing period. And then it comes to a point where 
our soul no longer can handle the karshati or the struggle within that one body. There's too many aches and pains. There's too much arthritis. You know, that is if one is lucky enough to go and reach old age. Some people leave are prematurely reincarnated, you can say. In fact, it's very interesting. Um, in Europe, any people who spoke about transmigration of the soul, they were considered heretics. That means that they were unlawfully spreading a philosophy that was not supported in Christian theology. They were considered to be uh, like witches or warlocks. And they might even be, uh, and if they were speaking very boldly about this, they would probably be prematurely reincarnated, if you know what I mean. So they would not live a full life. They would be considered uh, enemies of the church and they would be burned to the stake. Yeah, they would be burned alive and uh, considered to be uh, opponents to the uh, status quo. That is very sad. And, um, but that has been going on. And uh, this verse is very interesting because I know that uh, we have touched on this shloka uh, when I was able to come and visit your center at Scarborough. Uh, I know he, we have you know, run over this uh, verse and, and, and discussed it before. So what's really nice about this is that our consciousness is traveling within our body and we're picking up on, on uh, different conceptions of life. Uh, especially when a child is young. If you've got a teenager, 13, 14, maybe 15, uh, they're uh, trying to find their way through life. They have a choice which channels to go to and also which kind of association to lo log on to. Um, this is the time of making decisions for a lot of young people. And if they've actually been groomed and trained very well by their parents, they'll be able to make good decisions and good choices. But in the event that that's not the case, where a child is left, he or she, to be someone on their own, they're in a position where they're going to gravitate to where they're going to be loved and appreciated, noticed. That seems to be the way of things, nature of things. And so, that's a critical time. It really is a critical time. And so the sangha that a young person uh, can uh, accrue at that time is really important uh, for uh, determining the des their destiny in their life. So if you have good company, then you'll be in good association. You'll probably be blessed with the sattvic lifestyle. On the other hand, if you are going to find yourself in the company of, uh, well, kids who are, you know, not of the best kind and like that live on the other side of the tracks, so to speak, uh, they, uh, it, it could also very much determine your lifestyle and that you may go down dark regions. Someone has to be very careful. And you will take up different states of consciousness and then you will be born into a life that may be less fortunate. On the other hand, if you're in good company, then there will be good fortune and you'll be in a better situation uh, in the next life. So just like sometimes you, uh, uh, the air picks up different aromas. Srila Prabhupada talks about this. He says the air is traveling or the wind is traveling, a breeze, and it picks up a scent like if it goes over like a pile of manure, and Brapa talks about stool. So um, if, a, if a wind comes, a current comes, and it picks up the scent, and it, you're quite far away from it, and it'll go and it'll hit your travel for some meters, it will actually um, hit your nostrils, and you'll smell that manure or that stool, right? And uh, so, uh, then you appreciate the reality of it. It's really, it's really there. And then what happens at some point 
that current drops the smell and then it goes through, uh, that breeze goes through like a, a rose bush and it picks up that scent and then it carries it for some time. So while we are in our travels, we pick up on some good and bad elements. Purusho prakriti stari, bhumte prakriti janganan, karanan guna sangasya, sad asad yoni janmasu. The purush, the living entity, um, uh, comes in contact with prakriti, that is material nature. So we're talking about the soul, comes in contact with matter. And it meets with good and bad elements. Sad asad yoni janmasu. <clears throat> so it is at this point, that we can make decisions as to shall I go down the dark path or the path of enlightenment? Um, there are different margas or you know, paths that we can take in life. Um, <clears throat> there's the path of enlightenment, and also there's the path of uh, darkness, <clears throat> and one has that choice. So I remember meeting someone some years ago, and they were making reference to uh, George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw is an incredible writer. He's a playwright. He wrote uh, many stories. Uh, Cleopatra is one of them. And he was like a Shakespeare. And um, we have it near Niagara Falls, at Niagara on the Lake, there's the famous theater called uh, the Shaw Theater. And uh, many people come from all over the world to see excellent presentations of dramas. Uh, some are contemporary, some are more traditional. And um, so this one person I met, he was giving reference to reincarnation. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, George Bernard Shaw was a very famous writer. And at one particular event, he met a movie star. I don't know which one it was. Uh, but he's known to be very beautiful and attractive, as many movie stars are. And uh, even if you're not good, good looking and you get old, you can seemingly change on a new body through plastic surgery. So the, uh, <clears throat> the one fellow was taking, um, telling me about George Bernard Shaw. He was approached by this ravishing beauty. And she said, oh, maybe we can get married and then we can have children and our children uh, will be have my looks and they'll have your brains. So George Bernard Shaw said, my dear lady, the way karma often works, usually works, is that if that was to be the case, if we were to be married and have children, they'll probably have my uh, my looks and your brain. <laughs> so we had a good laugh over that. <clears throat> and so uh, this is really about destiny and uh, transmigrating from one body to another, which simply means my spirit soul is moving from one existence to the next. And Sri Krishna uh, makes a strong statement about uh, reincarnation uh, by using that shloka from chapter two. And so that in one life, our body changes according to science and according to Vedic knowledge too. Our body changes like practically every seven years, all these cells that are there have been broken up to become, uh, you know, uh, re-manifested. So we change uh, basically. And so if somebody takes prashadam and eats prashadam, only prashadam, for seven years, it means you have a prashadam body. That's the way we can look at that. Your body is now spiritualized, let's say. It's spiritualized. It doesn't mean that your senses aren't strong and you, that one of your senses might lead you uh, down a hellish path. But it does mean that your body has become transformed to be something that is uh, Krishnaized or prashadamized or spiritualized. So it's important to eat right the good prashadam.
and then your consciousness will automatically change. So it's all having to do so much with your environment. You know? So let's say if I was to live in tall grass, that's like the backdrop behind me. If I was to live in that and spend 24 seven in such an environment, I would start to feel like I'm, I'm some kind of corn plant or, you know, I am, uh, I feel like I'm grass. I would probably dream about grass. I remember when I was a teenager, my dad had arranged for us to work in the orchards. And I remember picking tomatoes. It was like kind of backbreaking, but it was, I totally appreciate what my dad was doing for us and giving us a sense of, uh, you know, good work ethics and we were earning some money and so on like that. So you're picking the, you're seeding the red tomatoes and you put them in the bushels. Well, the, in the nighttime, you'd be dreaming about red tomatoes, <laughs> you know, and if you uh, think too many, too much about tomatoes, hey, you might become a tomato. <laughs> uh, there was one of my godbrothers, his name was Achutananda. He was a Swami at one time. He's a real incredible humorist. He could have done stand-up comedian, like stand-up comedy. And he was once telling us that this, this is a true story about a man, he was in India and he got hit by a train. And uh, he was, uh, the people came out and uh, tried to come to his uh, rescue, but it was too far gone. And so then he, um, uh, uh, you know, he was pretty mangled, you could say. And uh, people were saying, is there anything you'd like us to do? Is there anything you wish us to do to, to help you during this last, these last few minutes? And he says, yes, I have one wish. I want a biddy. I want a, you know, cigarette. So uh, who knows? Uh, Krishna states in the Gita, another area where Krishna talks about transmigration. So he says, Yang Yang Vabi Spuran Pavan Chichanti Kalevaram Tong Tong Evaiti Kamti Yasadaga Baba Babita, which means that whatever you're thinking of at the time of death, that state you'll attain in your next life. So it could be that if that's the most important thing in your life to have a cigarette in your mouth before you die, who knows? You could become a tobacco plant in your next life. So um, these things might appear to be a little bit humorous, but they are actually possible. Srila Prabhupada talks about in a purport from the chapter uh, 14, the three modes of material nature. And uh, he is speaking about uh, cow killing. Here, here's one thing to consider. <clears throat> As far as, the, I'm, I'm going to read this to you. This is from a purport of 16. So it's 14, chapter 16, verse. As far as the mode of ignorance is concerned, the performer is without knowledge. And therefore, all his activities result in present misery. And afterwards, he will go on toward animal life. Animal life is always miserable, although under the spell of the illusory energy, Maya. The animals do not understand this. Slaughtering poor animals is also due to the mode of ignorance. The animal killers do not know that in the future, the animal will have a body suitable to kill them. That is the law of nature. So a word of caution here is that uh, if you do um, abuse someone and abuse to the point of uh, bringing them to their end, to their death, it could well be that that soul will come back in a body that will then retaliate and show vengeance and come after you. So this is karma. Uh, this is something we have to be very much uh, concerned about. Uh, that we will be haunted, uh, and therefore it behooves us to to be nice, you know, to be kindly, you know, towards uh, all forms of life. That uh, it is understood that 
during the time or the reign of Yudhishthir, King Yudhishthir, the eldest brother, uh, eldest fellow amongst the five Pandava brothers, his job, or like great, great kings like Prithu, there's, there's so many great political leaders that we read about in the Vedic literatures, they would see to it that no entity was unnecessarily harmed, not even a blade of grass, like a blade of grass also should be, uh, you know, not unnecessarily disturbed. That's how sensitive living entities were. And yet at the same time, Chattis might sometimes go and uh, either for defense or for practice, hunt a wild animal that might be a threat to yogis in meditation. So it's not that uh, kshatriyas or warriors or people of the royal order uh, did not engage in, uh, uh, let's say, some kind of uh, violence, acts of violence. Uh, they did do that, but uh, for the most part, they would try to avoid violence and they would protect. So as the name implies, kshatriya, that means to protect someone from being hurt, to serve and protect, which is the motto of some of our you know, police forces around the world. So I think it would be a good idea for us to now go to the next shloka. And we might like to put that on the screen for everybody. Uh, if the print could be nice and large, that'd be nice. Otherwise, you have your books there, okay? So we're looking at chapter 15, and it's text number 9. <clears throat> and Shrutram Shu, Rishasam Cha, Rishanam Granam Eva Cha, Adishtaya, Adishtaya, Vishayan Upasthevati. The living entity, thus taking another gross body, obtains a certain type of ear, eye, tongue, nose, and sense of touch, which are grouped about the mind. He thus enjoys a particular set of sense objects. Purport, again, by Srila Prabhupada. In other words, if the living entity adulterates his consciousness with the qualities of cats and dogs, in his next life, he gets a cat or dog body and enjoys. Consciousness is originally pure, like water. But if we mix water with a certain color, it changes. Similarly, Consciousness is pure, for the spirit soul is pure. But consciousness is changed according to the association of the material qualities. Real consciousness is Krishna consciousness. When, therefore, one is situated in Krishna consciousness, he is in his pure life. But if his consciousness is adulterated by some type of material mentality, in the next he gets a corresponding body. He does not necessarily get the human body again. He can get the body of a cat, dog, hog, demigod, or one of many other forms where there are 8,400,000 species. Okay, so that's the end of that purport. Thank you. We're uh, back again. And so uh, it's a nice conclusion to the first, the verse that we just went over, uh, text eight. Uh, the living entity takes another body and grouped around the mind. There's the soul, there's the mind, which capsulizes the soul along with intelligence and ego. And then around that is a body, a physical body, uh, with uh, certain kind of senses, sense organs. And uh, we have the, you know, a group of the mind and then attached to it are uh, other operating senses, 
that is uh, hands and legs and feet and the, the genitalia uh, and uh, so on and so forth. They're all attached to become one particular body. And um, since Prabhupada highlights in the purport the idea of uh, we are Krishna conscious initially, we fell prey to Maya, but we allowed independence to get the better of us. And as a result, because of being persistently wanting the so-called independence, therefore we are endowed with a physical body and we go through many species, many, many different lives before we come full circle and become a human again. Now, uh, as a human, we don't always make the grade. We may not be able to pull ourselves out of the cycle. It is possible that we will take birth again as a human, hopefully more evolved. That's why good works, punya, pious activities are important. And better than good works is uh, the work of God or the work of devotion. That particular term, good works, is something that in the Christian theology they frown down upon. The, in fact, the theology is that you can do good works, but you need the mercy of God or the mercy of Jesus, and then you will be redeemed, then you'll go to heaven. There's some truth to that. But usually what happens is that good works brings you to the point of wanting to be more spiritual. Being a good person doesn't necessarily mean that you're spiritual. It's like being a vegetarian it doesn't mean you'll go back to Vaikuntha. After all, rabbits, they eat grass, and they may not necessarily uh, go to, uh, you know, be, go to heaven in their next life. Or like a grasshopper, and I'm going to eat, chew on some of this grass behind me, it doesn't mean when I die and when I, get, I get eaten by another grasshopper or whatever uh, comes along to eat me. Uh, I'm not even sure what eats grasshoppers, but I'm sure there's some living creatures out there that will prey on a grasshopper. Then I may not necessarily go to heaven. So the point is that uh, if you can, through your species of life, engage in some punya, it does bring you to a better spot. Uh, Krishna also states that in the Bhagavad Gita, he says uh, that uh, it's a buildup of punya that can bring us to a point of building up determination to succeed spiritually. One of the most important commodities we can have in our devotional life is called dhrida brata. That means conviction in spiritual life. If we have determination, if we have that uh, confidence in spiritual life, we can succeed. We will succeed. The kind of confidence that the young boy Dhruva had when he was in the jungle, and he spent six months in there in deep meditation, very deep, uh, concentrated, focused uh, meditation. And because of that, the Lord came to him. First of all, he was blessed, blessed to see his guru Narada. Then he saw the Lord himself, Vishnu. And the Lord took his uh, sanka, his uh, conch, and touched it to the head of Dhruva, and he felt extremely blessed. So it's because he was very determined. Prahlad, another boy saint, he was very determined to not be swayed or submit to his father's tortures. Uh, Prahlad Maharaj is known to be the master of smaranam, remembrance, remembering God always through difficult circumstances. His consciousness was clean, it was pure, nothing could swerve him, you know, um, uh, away from devotional life and devotional thoughts. So he was successful. <clears throat> But this is, uh, I think, something we need to really concentrate on is to, uh, is to 
not be, uh, let's say, distracted, because we do live in an age uh, where there are weapons of mass distraction. Uh, uh, we are distracted and uh, uh, by these weapons of distraction, yeah, and which are destructive. So let us not just destroy our spiritual life. Let us not uh, do the wrong things. Let, let us uh, uh, honor devotees, people who are on the spiritual path. And an example is given, you can build a nice garden. You can put a, get a fantastic plants come up out of the ground, you know. And, uh, and it takes a long time. It takes watering, sunlight, moonshine, and so on like that to make the plants grow up really nice and strong um, and look, look luxuriant and uh, be able to offer themselves up to as a, a preparation for Krishna, you know, especially when it comes to vegetarian stuff. And, uh, but then if an elephant happens to come your way, well, the elephant is just, you know, pulled uh, like a banana plant out, like you have a banana plant or sugar cane and just, break it like anything and, uh, and, and what to speak of a garden with low lying kind of plant. Hila just all he has to do is just roll in there pull everything out with his trunk and in no time it's gone so if you're building up your uh, let's say a spiritual bank account and if you make a wrong decision and withdraw your money uh, you can spoil your whole uh, let's say security uh, measures so in the same way, if you build up your devotional creeper, your bhakti lata, your, your devotional plant, and if it um, quickly becomes destroyed due to offenses towards others, then especially towards divine people, divine personalities, then one has to be very careful. So very quickly, uh, we can destroy our devotional life and go down to uh, some lower existence. In Vrindavan, the holy place of pilgrimage, where uh, we see many pilgrims come everywhere from all over the world every day uh, to honor uh, Prakrama, to see the Murtis, to see Radhakun, Shamakun, to uh, circumambulate about Govardhan Hill and see all the other holy mandirs and spots where Krishna and his Leela, the Seva Kunj, and so on and so forth. It's all uh, really great. But if you make some uh, major offense there, uh, you can take birth as one of the big turtles at Radha Kund, or you can maybe take birth as a hog. But, but the, the beauty of it is that you're born in the Holy Dawn, you know. Or you can be one of those crazy monkeys that jump around and try to steal your bananas, you know. Um, it is possible. That this can be, the, but because you, you know, holy dawn, you might have to take one more birth, and then because you made an offense. So, in terms of our spiritual evolution and getting out of the cycle of birth and death, we definitely have to build up our spiritual bank account and invest, invest deeply by acts of devotion, you know, acts of devotion. And if we uh, are, people come and ask me, and they say. What do I do about pride? I have bad thoughts about others, and sometimes I'm, my ego gets the better of me, and uh, I say the wrong things, do the wrong things. How can I, what can I do about that? That build up of what I believe to be uh, mounds of bad karma. So the answer is perform acts of humility, uh, or go to those persons that you figure you're offended and try to make up for it. You know, it's a, not an easy thing to do, but some or other, we have to try. We must attempt to uh, do this, uh, this thing of uh, <clears throat> making amends. Uh, making amends for our wrongdoings is uh, practically our life mission. You know? uh, we want to come out clean, uh, pure, spotless. Uh, uh, Cultivating purity. Chapter 4 in the Bhagavad Gita is much about cultivating knowledge and, uh, and, and ending up in a pure state of mind. Uh, and then and slashing the doubts 
of, uh, uh, of ignorance, you know, with the weapon of knowledge. Uh, nice verse from the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Tisma, again, Sanbhutan, Ritsdhan Jnana Chinatmana, Sinatmana. And Chitvainang Sang Shayam Yogam, Atishtu Tishta Bharata. Uh, therefore, the doubts which have arisen in your heart out of ignorance should be slashed by the weapon of knowledge. Armed with yoga, O Bharat, stand and fight. Good. So now, just a, a little remark about our modern day culture in the West and also now in the East. People have incredible fondness towards animals, pets, especially cats and dogs. And Prabhupada would always bring up this point about cats and dogs. Uh, they would be repeated again and again almost as much as the Hare Krishna Mahamantra cats and dogs. So there's so much attention given to animals and very little to God. So too much attention to EOG and not enough to GOD. And that is a very unfortunate kind of situation. Um, uh, people are lonely, so they have a pet, they have an animal. Uh, to uh, uh, give them some kind of company. And what's nice about having an animal is that you feel like you're God because you are lording over that animal. You're telling them what to do all the time. And people feel a sense, hey, I'm God now. Finally, I made it. I made the grade. But actually, a better position to be in is to, uh, is to be, feel, this, feel oneself to be the servant and to be for the small. Don't let us not forget this soul that transmigrates. It's, one ten thousandth the size, the tip of a hair. And if you put that little spark of life, which is so tiny, against our ego, you'll see a gulf of difference. You'll see the ego, if you can imagine, just just picture it, you know, pretend it's there. Well, it is there, but I'm just saying, if it has a physical shape or form, it would be huge. And then next to it is our spiritual life so uh, our spiritual self our the atma so what our business is is to try to some or other bring the ego down to its proper size and to try to deflate that balloon so to speak of hot air and uh, and come down to the state of reality reality is I'm a I, I'm a part and parcel of the supreme I, I am not God I, I never will be God, but I'll always be a little God. Uh, I'll, I'll be a little servant. I can make some decisions that makes me feel like I am, you know, something, I have some kind of control. So Krishna is put into a, into a position of the great creator. He has put us into a situation where we're allowed to make choices. So we have to look at those trails the navriti and pravriti. Nivriti means the path of uh, righteousness. And pravriti marga means the path of just, uh, let's say, sense uh, uh, aggrandizement, uh, self-absorption, uh, meaning end up into the body. And so we have those choices. We meet them all the time. Uh, 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 as a child, we grew up watching The Wizard of Oz, that famous movie, and there's that scene where the four characters are going down the trail. There's Dorothy and Toto, there's this, the Scarecrow, there's the Cowardly Lion, and there's the Tin Man. And they come to a section of the forest where, uh, I, this is before they meet the lion, uh, and they have a direction, you go this way, and then you go that way. My hands are not allowed to do what I want to do here, my fingers. <clears throat> so look at your choices and do that. Be wise. Go for the long-term benefit. You know? Do not go for the short-term. And unfortunately, we live in an age and a time where people vie for going with that, which is going to be stimulating now, immediate. So... Uh, you will get that stimulation, but in the long term, is it really good? I mean, is it good to drop out of school right off? Although some of the greatest thinkers and most thoughtful people didn't go to school, 
Shakespeare never set foot in a college. <laughs> but I'm saying the average person, uh, you know, best to, you know, take yourself to a level of education <clears throat> that will bring you into a better spot in life, a happier kind of existence. And that's what the most important education is what we find in chapter four, um, transcendental knowledge, uh, cultivate that kind of knowledge. That is more important than any other kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, materialistic kind of uh, educational wisdom, which tends to change in time. You know, everything's kind of, let us go for relevant truth and not relative truth. Let us go for absolute truth and not relative truth. When I say relative, that which tends to change. And also it might have something to do with your relatives because you have relatives now, but when you die, those relatives won't be around. You'll have to establish a new kind of a, a company, a new kind of connection with people biologically. So I'm just going to look at the time right now. It is exactly about 10 minutes for questions and answers. But let me just sum up by saying we have an obligation as humans to end this cycle, to stop the reincarnation. You know, the karma must come to an end. Hare Krishna. Questions? I believe that Jagannath Mishra Prabhu had a question. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful class, Maharaj. Uh, words of wisdom, it was really easy for uh, devotees to understand where you connected uh, the wonderful verse from the second chapter, Dehi Nos Men Neta Dehe, as well as from the eighth chapter, Yam Yam Vapi Smaran Bhavam, and also the wonderful purport that you read from 14.16 as well, Maharaj. So this gives us a nice composite uh, view of uh, reincarnation. And also, um, you know, when you mentioned about, um, you know, the geese, the V for Vaishnava or Vishnu, uh, the teamwork and the solidarity, it, 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 gives us, uh, it gave us a lot of insights. And also, you know, we can take more points from this about uh, succession planning as well. You know, the leader is there and then someone else uh, takes over, uh, just like the body replaces another body in relevance to today's uh, class. So thank you so much, Maharaj. Yes, there are some questions. And uh, one of the questions from um, Jagrat Mishra, Prabhu is how can you define um, consciousness uh, for a newcomer in about 30 seconds or less how can we we can explain to them very easily what is consciousness well in 30 seconds or less they're supposed to be okay okay uh, consciousness is that uh, let's say consciousness is awareness uh, it is um, it is the vital force that emanates from the, uh, the self, the Atma. Uh, the Atma is um, our true identity. Uh, it is a spark of life. It is composed of, of uh, eternity, knowledge, bliss. It, uh, it has no, there's no scope for it perishing. The soul is eternal despite the body change, which has been our topic. So uh, uh, consciousness is that which flows like through the practically through the bloodstream and through the body uh, from the uh, area of the soul, which is located in the heart. So uh, we have to be, when we say to be conscious, it means to be con in touch with yourself, to be conscious of yourself as a spiritual being, not as a physical being so much. So more concentration on uh, the, the spirit is what is required and uh, be aware that uh, everything that exists in this world is uh, also uh, an emanation from the Supreme Consciousness, Krishna. So it is, uh, consciousness is uh, what, to, you know, we have to, it's a state of awareness. So pick up on the, Krishna consciousness and let it carry you through uh, into the next life. If not, you'll be able to go back home, back to God. So yeah, I, you're, you're giving me a little time. My timeline is very short. I hope that helps a little bit.
Thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, hopefully that's, that, that answers the question. Um, and uh, this is with regard to your Vyasa Puja celebrations tomorrow, Maharaj. And we know that uh, there is, uh, um, you know, restrictions and only few devotees can be there. So the question is, uh, is there going to be a, a Zoom uh, live uh, a link uh, that uh, devotees can uh, join and participate? That you're aware well, of, I'm, right? I'm not sure. I'm not arranging the birthday party, Prabhu. <laughs> That's a question from one of the devotees. I'm just asking that. <laughs> well, I can just say that uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be available at 3 o'clock at Temple 243 Avenue Road. And we're going to do a little bit of walk uh, down through the brickworks. And it's a beautiful spot, you know, down the ravine. And it'll look right back to the temple itself. So anybody is interested in that, and you can just come show up. As I know that they're going to show the 22-minute uh, film of uh, the Walking Monk, uh, and I think I, sh I should just give you the contact of uh, Ruth Mini. I think she's the best person to uh, to tell us about that. Um, it is said here, Ruth Mini, mother is going to set up the zoom okay okay so that that'll be great uh Mada. so um now how do how do the devotees get to know that so maybe they should probably contact uh jagannath mishra prabhu or rukmini so uh, uh, oh yeah jagannath mishra is saying like he says i can get that link okay so um that'll be great uh, thank you very much uh um so, so another question, Maharaj, why was the church against the theology of the, you mentioned about uh, the church was against the theology of uh, a reincarnation. Um, uh, what was the, uh, what is the church's uh, position as of now? Well, I think the church, I mean, I'm not an authority. I don't work for the Vatican. I don't serve there, but uh, um, the, uh, according to their doctrines, reincarnation is not a, a major uh, component of their belief system. <clears throat> and so they don't uh, take too kindly. I, I believe that a lot of Christians and Catholics in particular, they do believe in reincarnation. Uh, whether the church believe, likes that or not, uh, it is, it's a fact. You know, when you talk to many people, they believe in an afterlife. They believe that, yeah, I was somewhere before, or they look at their animal, their pet, their dog or cat, said, I, there's a real person there. And that person, you know, is real. And uh, I believe that that, that <clears throat> that dear comrade of mine is, is, is going places or has come from somewhere else and has, has some qualities uh, from the past. Even some of the Greek, uh, let's say, uh, the Greek thinkers, the pundits, they believe, I think it was Pythagoras, he said something about uh, his friend had taken birth as the dog. So, um, but that's Greek theology and that uh, they were quite prominent before Christianity. Uh, so um, uh, Christians like to believe in general that uh, you're here this one life and you are, uh, do good works, you will do God's work and then you'll go to heaven. And if you, you do very negative things and violent things that are corrupt and cruel, then you will go to another existence hell. And of course, in our Vedas, there are cases for that because uh, the fifth canto gives an outline of you know, hellish regions and heavenly regions and so on and so forth. <clears throat> but uh, we, uh, we prescribe to the... Um, the evolution. Our Darwin has his theory, but we have our doctrine of uh, the soul's evolution, uh, moving up, moving up to different grades, higher grades, and uh, no, hopefully not coming to that, sliding down to the uh, the spiraling down to a lower existence. So I, I would say that uh, because I'm not a, a follower of the Christian theology, but just Based on my own experience, that's what they say. If you want to compare notes, um, you know, you know, so, some people even say that Jesus was uh, you know, 
there, there was something about Isaiah and that John the Baptist was uh, formerly Isaiah, another sort of like religious man. There's references in Christianity, Christian theology about transmigration of the soul, but you can try to argue that with uh, Christian followers, but you probably won't get anywhere because it doesn't help that much. I think the best approach is to just make everyone, uh, you know, that you meet people of that that tradition, you get them to honor some nice prashadam. <laughs> if you have a that doesn't have so much, uh, uh, so many sharks in it and oil, you know, like nice, good, sundry food, and uh, that way you'll win their hearts, and then we can come closer. Some people love to argue. They just love to argue because they believe they're of another tradition. Uh, they come from a different spiritual background, and so they just believe that their purpose is to break your wall. You know, we have a wall. We'll break our wall. You come to my side of the fence, and then we'll be okay. But I, uh, I, I think we should really uh, try to see where you can uh, look at the similarities in the different theologies and practices. But some people just don't want to do that. They just want to highlight how they're different. And it's usually just in practice. But in belief, as far as, uh, let's say, uh, testimony as to if there's a God, everyone pretty much has the same understanding. It's a higher power, a higher intelligence. There's a person behind it. Uh, 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 and that, that's what's most important is to highlight the similarities and not the differences. Thank you, Maharaj. So it's, it's very interesting, Maharaj, because, um, you know, Isaac Newton found the law of gravity. He's from Europe, in fact, uh, United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, f from, from India, maybe we can say, yeah, we don't, because it's, it's only, we don't say it's only for Europe. It's, it's a universal principle. Uh, when we are having gulab jamun, if we drop it, it'll go down. So we be, <laughs> it's a reality. It's not like uh, it's just meant for one area where somebody found this. So similarly, reincarnation, all the truth is there, as you mentioned in various parts of Bhagavad Gita and other scriptures as well. So it's a universal truth. And I guess it's because it's not, it's, it's complicated as well. And it's not very obvious, like the law of gravity. And the good example that you mentioned, Maharaj, about the George Bernard Shaw and the girl, uh, you know, it's not just uh, one person's brain and another person's look uh, will be, it's not black and white. It's much more complicated than that. So that's a wonderful yeah. answer, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe we can take one more question, Maharaj, one more question that has come through, not directly uh, related to today's topic of reincarnation, but this can set us up so that we don't reincarnate. Again, it comes down to chanting. And again, which is a, a age old question, Maharaj, uh, you know, how can we sort of uh, control our mind and, uh, you know, get, to get your insights on, um, you know, how can we chant without our mind getting distracted? Well, if you have another few hours, we can answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, uh, the, the exact question is, how can we, um, you know, control our wandering mind? That's the question that has come, uh, especially when we are chanting. How can we control the wandering mind? Uh, perhaps, here's an interesting take on, you know, because I've answered that question many different ways. How to control the wandering mind? Well, why don't uh, you wander and then there will be less control? Mm. Uh, mm. Contemplate less. Uh, let's say think less, do more. Mm. Or like a child, you know, when a baby, we're all little babies, really, in essence. And when a baby is, uh, the studies have been done about children, infants, and a child has a hard time just to sit still, as we all know. Mm. But if the child is uh, moving, you know, that's why you put him in the Ferris wheel, you know, or that's why you put him in a stroller, uh, you know, when they're younger, and uh, you have them moving, then they seem to be very content and more focused. Mm. You know? So the whole, uh, what I'm getting at is that keep yourself busy. Mm. Keep yourself busy and uh, think less, uh, contemplate less on, uh, you know, your desires or what you lost or what you hope to gain. Um, in other words, less hankering and, more, and uh, less lamentation. Live more in the present moment. I, I just want to say that clearly. Living in the present, try to focus on what you're doing. 
You try to focus on the sound vibration, think less about the future or the past, and uh, be there right now. Be here now, as the saying goes. And uh, yes, the mind will divert it to all other places, but because it is that way, at least put yourself in a good environment. Adorn your walls with beautiful air aspects of Krishna, uh, uh, Leela of the Lord, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and something like that. Um, if, since the mind wanders, let it wander to these, uh, these images. And uh, try to go to holy places. Now, even with pandemic lockdown, go outside, go for a walk. You know, you'll learn a lot. Uh, touch nature. Uh, get some good air. Get some vitamin D. And uh, live a good, healthy life so that your the spiritual life can be more enriched and enhanced. So I'm giving a lot of some hints what to do. Um, persistence and the Gita, wherever the mind wanders, uh, control it, grab it, and bring it back under the control of the self. So like some, like a child, like a like a, a child that likes to crawl away and get adventures. You want to give him or her some space. But if they go a little bit into dangerous territory, you want to bring him back mm. under the control of the self. Wonderful, Maharaj. I, I, I think uh, there are many takeaways from today's class and uh, the one that you just mentioned, living in the present, uh, not in the past or the future, because when we start chanting in the morning, how we lived our life yesterday is significantly important because if we, have, <laughs> if we had... Uh, many things uh, that were not the best and that's what haunts us the next day. So I think uh, this is a wonderful uh, instruction, Maharaj, living in the present and not in the past and the future. So with that, uh, Maharaj, uh, we would like to thank you for this wonderful class on two wonderful Bhagavad Gita verses from the 15th. Can, I, can I say something? Please Your go ahead. Your favorite word is wonderful. Yes, Maharaj. Your favorite because it word. is wonderful. <laughs> yes, and, and, and the background as well is wonderful as well. Refreshing the green background with the orange address is fantastic as well, Maharaj. <laughs> so on behalf of all the devotees, I would like to thank you for this nice class, Maharaj. And uh, we hope to have you again uh, very soon uh, for Iskon Scarborough devotees, Maharaj. And, and not just Iskon Scarborough devotees, because we also had uh, Ananga Manjari and the family from Mauritius as well today. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> so thank you so much, Maharaj. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Hare Krishna.